Okay. Yes, I am Thomas Voick. I have the California Cranial Institute, Los Gatos, California, which is Silicon Valley. I started studying cranial dental in 1986 with Harvey Getzoff, who's an amazing craniopath who's not here. He's usually at these. And Al Chinapi, a phenomenal dentist, and they taught there. I started studying. I was doing medical illustrating and research at UCLA uh, and going to the SOT conferences and state licensing seminars and TMJ by a dentist in my first year of chiropractic school. I kept going on and on. By the time I had finished chiropractic school, I was always already working in cranial dental. I opened the California Cranial Institute in 1992, and I'm still at the same address, never moved. And I'm in Silicon Valley, and I've treated thousands upon thousands of cranial dental cases at this point. Uh, I'm going to share some information. I just have to give a little more background. Some of the cranial procedures I do aren't really taught. Uh, a lot of the things that I do in the sphenal maxillary area have come down from Dr. Curtis Budding and have evolved over the years, and we're still even working on things. I'm meeting him next week in Palm Desert, and we continue to work on things. So, Forward head posture. Uh, Richard Gerardo, thank you so much. Is he still here? He did a great job. He did so much work. And, and all the literature in forward head posture is in the dental community. Now, you don't get a lot in orthopedics. You don't get a lot in chiropractic. You don't see it in the physical therapy literature. I did a search, and I started coming down with dozens and dozens of articles, and the dentists are all over it. And where are we? We're the ones that treat the cervical spine. So we know it's a huge component, and most of your forward head posture, and I'll submit that, 90-some percent is coming from the cranial dental area. And what happens is with this forward head posture long enough, you start to get breakdown in the cervical spine. And this is a, two different cases. I, I, patients were unfortunate. I was fortunate to get 60 of these cases in about a 12, 13 month period. We wrote two of them up. Um, so what happens is you get a breakdown and you end up having fusion surgery or cervical disc replacement surgery. Um, this 52 year old lady, this one on, uh, it was 2015. This was a case I took on last summer. So it was a year later. She had uh, radiculopathy pain, burning pain in her hands. She was unable to even hold a cup anymore. Uh, she had some very serious issues. And systemic issues. So as we talk about when you get the forward head posture, when you get the cranial dura torquing, when the mandible compensates and go posterior, they have a malocclusion, they're clenching on it, they're aggravating the cranial fault. The head goes forward, the whole body is going to slump. So they start to have issues all over the place. Now they take the follow-up MRI and everything looks great. And they can't figure it out. Now somebody thought they saw a dural fistula. It turned out that wasn't there. She was sent to UCSF uh, Medical School. It's one of the best uh, neurological brain research places in the country to see if she had a demyelinating disorder or some neurodegenerative disease, and that's when I got her, in the middle of all this. So, this is really interesting, because this, I'm kind of cutting ahead a little bit, but this was the first uh, visual exam done, it was an x-ray, and clearly you can see there's a forward head posture, there's a breakdown of the discs here at C5, 6, C6, 7, uh, and that was the last image done after the surgery. And we can see in here that we've had a lot of work done. Uh, but kind of interesting to me that right along here you can see a little compression into the spinal cord itself still. But the hallmark of the two images is the head posture really isn't changed at all. It's still forward. Left sacroiliac, category two the cervical spine antalgia forward, maxillary deficiency, and the biggest thing, and I'm, I think you've heard a lot today, but what I find, and I'm sure you, you probably find the same thing, but the underdevelopment of the maxilla is the key. That's what I find the key to the whole cranium. You want to talk about malocclusion. Teeth are an extension of the bone. When you see a narrow arch here, you're looking at a narrow arch in the maxilla itself. It doesn't grow properly. I think they did a good job this morning explaining all the deficiencies in the maxilla and growth and why these things are happening. She had a left temporal mandibular joint uh, anterior displacement with reduction. 
uh, decreased uh, mandibular range of motion. Her occiput was an extension, uh, and it was a right occiput extension, cranial distortion. So my typical protocol is eight visits with me, four with the dentist in a four-week period. Typically, we'll have it, and I'm doing a different kind of cranial work, and we do a lower splint, and we reevaluate at that time. This was about a five-week case, and they'll see me, and they'll go right to the dental office. They won't chew. They'll be examined and equilibrated with the lower splint and a sitting in an upright position. If you're working with a dentist at this point, always ask the patient if they checked you when you were sitting up, as opposed to laying like this in a chair with the head like this, because you're gonna have the wrong occlusal pattern, the jaw's different like this, than like this. So we have a specific way of checking. <clears throat> she came in, her VAS pain levels were 8.5, came down to a three, that was pretty good. The burning pain was gone. The discomfort was in her neck was a three. No radiculopathy anymore. Strength came back in the hands. That's it. Uh, she could, she'll need to get treatment. I mean, she's been altered and she's 52. She comes in about once a month just to maintenance and, uh, and do that. But a significant change and a significant change in a short period of time. Same thing here, 32 year old male. <clears throat> He had had the disc uh, replacement surgery two years earlier. He was an avid runner. He was unable to go out and really walk for more than half a mile due to pain. He was very limited. Same thing, burning pain, radicular pain down the arms. He was prescribed a lower dental mandibular mouth guard for nighttime clenching. Similar case. Same thing, we get the forward head posture, we have an anterior premature contact. They hit the teeth hard in the front, it's never good. One thing chiropractors can do to check occlusion, very simple, get some dental tape, put it in the front, have them bite down. If they're hitting that hard in front, put your finger and have them tap. You feel a strong vibration there, very simple. Right away, you've got a dental referral. They shouldn't hit that hard in front. If they hit hard in front, the mandible's going back, the fox cerebra, uh, cerebri is distorting, the tentorium is distorting, the cervical spine is going forward, and we got a lot of neurological issues happening. He had also had a right occiput in extension cranial distortion. It was the same thing, treated a collaborative model. I treated about eight visits, he had four with the dentist, we went back and forth. Uh, after 11 visits, he went climbing in Yosemite, he went running, this case was, uh, it was last summer, again. He ran nine miles last week and he's training for a marathon now because I saw him two days ago, right before I left. He comes in once a month, just for maintenance at this point. So we need to integrate, all right? I, what I'm doing cranial is a little bit different. My model of treatment's a little bit different. The concepts that you're hearing here are the same. What, what Richard went over this morning, all these things you heard about how things function. We're, we're coming up with better and better models of treatment. Um, but the concepts are there. And I think all of us need to work together more. Uh, I think it would be great. Uh, chiropractors need to learn basic occlusion and understand that. Uh, dentists need to do a systems review and maybe take a better history if their patient has vertigo. Because the dentists are treating all these cases are going through their office that they don't even know they're part of the component that is either hurting them or could help them. And, and so it's, it's all about creating this integration and working better. I do want to show one thing about a little test, if I can. Can I do that? Could I have a volunteer? And I would ask you if I could. Yes? Because there's something very simple you can do to tell these things. Now, one of the problems is forward head posture, uh, TMJ and, do you have a TMJ issue? No. no TMJ issue. Doesn't hurt. Go ahead, open up. It opens really nice. Forward head posture. Let's bring it back. Now open your mouth. Very difficult. A sore. Yeah. yeah, real hard. That's where her neck should be. That's the test you do. She's a great TMJ here. It's fine. I don't have any problem at all. Thank <laughs> you.
Now, the minute I go up like this, I can't open my mouth. This is a cranial mandibular case. This is an integrative case. This is a cranial dental case. So you can see this and you can spot this very easily. She had eight. So she has a terrible maxillary deficiency. And her mandible has gone back and she's compensated like this. Now she's opening fine here. But if you put her in a physiological position that's better for her spine, she can't open her mouth. So she's going to do this. So what's going to happen? Anterior cervical disc disease, among others. <laughs> Eventually. No, but you can fix these things. You can fix it. Does that make sense? So that's a simple test anybody can do. Two seconds. And then, then you know. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that.